Hey there, in this video we are talking about using return statements in C++ to send information back out of a function back to the caller. And this covers section 6.7 to 6.9 basically in the Gaddis textbook. The last video we were talking about sending information into a function via the parameters and the parentheses of the function call. So this is the reverse of how do you get information back out via what's called the return statement. Okay, well, there's a keyword called return. You're familiar with this. We have it at the end of a main function all the time. So a function that does return a value, you've got to have this in the function, and that statement does two things. Uh, item number one, when you hit the return, you jump out of the function, back to whoever called you. Item number two, you're sending back one piece of information that you wrote right after this val for value. Um, that thing you're sending back right there, it could be a variable, it could be a literal number like the zero in the main function. You could put a whole mathematical expression there, like score one plus score two can go there. And whatever is there, it gets computed, and then that one thing gets sent back to whoever called your function. Now, this return statement is required in any function with a return value. It's optional in a void function. So when you have a void function, you do not need the return statement to specify what's being sent back. You look at all of our recent examples, the last couple of videos, all the examples have all been void functions, and that's why they have not had a return statement in them. But any other kind of function has got to have that, like the main function needs to return an integer. Um, so when that data gets sent back in your return statement, the function call statement takes on that value in the function call. And then you can do whatever you want with it. You can print it, you can send it, you can assign it to a variable, you can use it in a piece of math, whatever you like. Uh, the returned value must match the type in the function header. Remember, the return type is the very first thing in the function header, like int main parentheses. That int, that's the return type, and you're committing to returning an integer at the end. So it's the very first thing you say in your function header, what type of data is gonna come back, and it's the very last thing that happens in your function to send back that type of data. They've gotta match up or there's gonna be a compiler error. But I wanna emphasize that functions just have one return value, that's it. Functions only return one, just one value at a time. If you think back to the mathematical definition of a function in math class, that's the whole point of a function, actually. The whole point of a function is a relation that always produces exactly one output value. So our functions in C++ are doing exactly that. That's exactly that idea. And again, you know, some other languages call these, you know, call functions by different names, but I like the fact that we use the name function to, um, to emphasize that. So exact same concept in computing. A function can only return one value. You don't have any other options than that. Uh, now, some people uh, actually go so far that a function with no return value, a void function with no return value, they actually use a different name for that. Because mathematically, functions always have one output. So some people like to call a void function a procedure instead, technically. I probably don't get that, um, that uh, I probably don't split that hair myself. But I understand why some people do that. You know, mathematically, if, it's, if there's no one return value, that's not a function. So on the one hand, that's a little bit restrictive, only being able to pass back one thing. Um, it's a little bit simpler than the story for incoming parameters where you can have none or one or two or three or four. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe in the future, we'll think of some ways to get around that limitation. But for now, I like the fact that this syncs up with the definition of a mathematical function. It's exactly that. So here is program 612 in the book, which I think is the first example of an interesting return value. It says here, this program uses a function that returns a value, I guess for the first time. So of course there's a main function, but then we also have a prototype for a function called sum. And it takes two parameters and they're both integers. And the interesting thing is the return type is an integer, just like main is actually. So hopefully the name is descriptive enough that you can immediately tell what this is gonna do it's called sum, so it's gonna take these two integers, add them together for the sum, and return that number. Uh, here's the main function, make a couple of variables. Value one will be holding 20. Value two will be holding 40. There's a total variable here to store the result. The interesting thing is line 17. 
there is your function call. And as it says here, we're going to call the sum function, passing those values as arguments, and then assign the return value to the total variable. So this jumps into the sum function, does its job, comes back with a number, and then assigns it into total to store it. And then here's the output part of the program. The sum of this and sum of 20 and 40 will be whatever it says in total. So um, let's see exactly what the sum function looks like. Very, very simple. All right, here's the sum function. Takes in these two integers. It's calling these parameters num1 and num2. And it returns, right? It does num1 plus num2 and then returns it. When you add two integers, the result's an integer. So that syncs up with this return type of integer. And let's actually go back to the main function. So again, when this runs, it's going to jump you back to line 17 and then assign it. So a couple of points about that. Um, if you have a, a value returning function, make sure you do something with it. You know, I on line 17, I could write just some value one, value two. That will compile, but it's useless because it doesn't do anything with return value. Make sure for value returning functions, you do something with it. In this case, we're assigning it into a variable to store the result. You could have printed it out. I could have put count arrow sum value one value two, and it would just immediately print it out. I could put it in a larger piece of math, but you've got to do something with it. Otherwise, you're just wasting time on the processor and the result just gets thrown away. So make sure you do something with it. Probably the most common thing is just save it in a variable like this. The other thing I want to emphasize here is, you know, you can have a complicated expression like this doing math here. I hope you remember this line 32 here, because I find beginning programmers, like in a couple days, they think that return can only have one single variable after it. They think they can only write return num1. But you're not restricted like that. You can put any kind of math expression on the right, kind of like assignment statement, and the, uh, the processor will do that job. It'll add it, it'll multiply, it'll divide it, and whatever the result is, that's what's going to return out of the function. Notice you don't need parentheses for that. It's not a function call. But you can put any kind of complicated thing here you like, and the result is what's going to get returned. So to be clear, um, when you call uh, that function, this is actually what happens. When you get to that critical line 17, right, the sum function gets called. So you jump down into this function on this slide. right? As that happens, you're going to copy, pass by value, the 20 from value 1 gets copied into num1. The 40 from value 2 gets copied into num2. Then you can do your job, comes out to be 60, obviously, and that jumps back to where you called it with that number 60. And at that point, this reference to sum actually is holding the number 60. And then one more thing happens, that gets assigned in a total in order to store it. So you should definitely do something like that. And that's what happens with re value returning functions. Now, here's a little slice of another program. And again, you really ought to look at the book and see all these other interesting examples. So the next example program, 613, has a function called square uh, to square a number. Like, I think up until this point, we've either been doing, you know, number times number or we've been doing pow, number, comma, two. But here, to make things a little bit simpler, they make their own function called square to find the square of a number. And they use it in this program to compute the area of a circle. And of course, the area of a circle is found by pi times the radius squared. So that's what you have here for this formula. And when you get to this line, first of all, you call the square function. And at this point, radius will be 10. So you jump into this function. You copy the 10 from radius into number. This function does its job, number times number. 10 times 10 gives you 100. And then it returns back to this line because there's more work to be done. At this point, square counts as 100. And then there's some more work. And then what happens is you do pi times 100, which will be about 314 or so. And then that gets assigned into area. So that's a pretty good example of a function call that's in the middle of a larger statement. And you do that job, you come back with a number, you return the number, and then you do the rest of the math with that number. So I think this is kind of an interesting example, and uh, as a result, I've pulled up program 613 of the IDE so we can test it. Now, this is a slightly larger program. Not too surprising. Uh, the whole point of this part of the course is to handle larger programs. So uh, this program has a main function, 
And it also has a function called get radius, which sounds to me like an input function, get the radius from the user. And it has a function called square, which is a calculating function, a processing function, right? Takes in a double number, is gonna square it, returns a double like we said. So the main function sets up a constant for pi, makes variable, declares variables for input and for output basically, uh, sets the decimal place, prompts the user, this program calculates the urban circle, calls the get radius function. That's gonna let the user type in the radius, gonna return it, gonna come back from the function with the return value, and it's gotta do something with that return value, and what it does is it assigns it into this radius val variable to be stored. Great. Then you go down here, this is the calculating formula, of course, and you call the function first, call that square function to square the radius, and then take that return value, whatever comes back, then you multiply it by pi. Then you assign that to the area. Okay, so a couple different things happening on line 26, perfectly fine. And then you should be able to print out the area is whatever that number is. Uh, here is the get radius function, that input function, right? Declare some data, this variable called rad. Uh, prompt the user, get them to send in a number to rad, and then whatever that is, return it. Right, that's gonna be a double, which syncs up with the double return type. Good. And here is the square function we're looking at. Uh, take in a number, multiply it by itself, right? Whatever the result is there, return it. Of course, the result will be a double. That should work perfectly fine. So let's try this and hopefully it's gonna check out of properly computing the area of a circle. This program calculates the area of a circle, enter the radius of a circle. So just like we saw in the lecture slide, I'm gonna try 10. And it says the area is about 314, which is which we knew. Good. So as far as I can tell, this seems to be working correctly with that one test case. There's one little detail here that I'm interested in for this program. Uh, so I'm going to uh, step through this in the debugger just once and hopefully kind of quickly. How many variables does this program have? I guess it's got, so it's got radius and area. And as I, as I add watches for these variables, hopefully you can guess what it's gonna start out as. And what else do I have? I have rad down here. And this function has a parameter called number. Okay, so hopefully you could guess that um, as the program starts in the main function, right? These variables are holding random garbage. Uh, radius is a double. So it's holding this crazy random scientific notation number 4.821 blah, 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 times 10 to the negative 304th power. Um, and that's, you know, that's actually how doubles are stored. They're stored in scientific notation like that. So not too surprising. Now area just happened to be zero. Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes, sometimes you get lucky, but you can't depend on that because that could, that could have been any number at all. The other two variables don't exist yet because they only have scope in the functions where they're declared. They're local variables, of course. So they won't even exist in memory until we get into those functions. So let's start stepping through this. Um, so, okay, so great, set the precision. Got some space here, put up the prompt. Right, this program calculates the area of a circle. So we're about to step into the get radius function. I'll go into that function. And we get the, we've got the uh, rad now uh, exists, right? The rad variable was actually created in memory at this point. Currently got random garbage, crazy scientific notation number, not too surprising. Uh, we'll get the user prompt. And then this sin statement happens. Mm, 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 we have to do that. So uh, for argument's sake, let me put in a radius of five. When I hit enter, that'll go into rad, I hope. Great, so rad's got five now. Now we're gonna return out of this uh, function. So we're gonna jump back into the main function. And now I'm on line 26 and uh, I have to do all this stuff. So obviously you go into the square function first, passing in that five, jump in here. So you can see number got five passed by value in there. And then this line here happens and number times number is obviously 25. So we're coming out of this square function, and this is the thing I want to ask about is, what line are we going to go back to? And as this program gets a little bit large, I'm going to try to get the whole thing on screen. 
to kind of zoom out a bit. So um, we were called from line 26. There's the call to square. And you can see the debugger is pointing out when I'm in the square function, these other variables are not available, right? By default, you do not have access to data in other functions. And the debugger here is telling us that, yeah, these other variables, you cannot access them right, right now. As far as you're concerned for the programmer down here, they don't exist as far as you know. Uh, so the only variable that exists is number. But we're about to jump back into the main function. But what line? What line do you think we're going to jump back to? Let's see. Get my key to go back. Okay, so we jump back to line 26, and we've been saying when you, when you jump back from a function call, you jump back to the end of the function call, but you see line 26 is not done. There's more work to be done, right? There's, there's a multiplication yet to come. There's an assignment yet to come. So we're actually back on line 26 about to do the rest of the stuff. The function call has come back, and as far as the program is concerned, this square counts as the number 25 now. So when I next line that, I'll zoom this back up so we can see it a little better. Um, so when I next line this, now the rest of line 26 is going to happen. You take the 25, multiply by, five, by pi, right? the debugger is kind of reminding me about that, then that gets assigned into area. Let's watch that. Okay, so now area has the number 78.5397499 repeating forever is what it's trying to say there. Um, and I think that's about right. So, you know, it ought to be like 25 times 3, more or less, about 75. Yeah, okay, that checks out. And, um, and then, of course, the rest of the program happens, and it says the area is that number. So don't forget, you can totally put a function call in the middle of a larger statement, and it's going to do the function call, then come back, and then do the rest of the statement. Perfectly fine. Another good example. So here's program 614. You can see the whole thing in the book, but I'm just sliced out. It's kind of an interesting part. So here's two separate functions in a program that does some recipe calculations. So you, on line 40, you have a function called show intro, right? Don't forget you ought to have an introductory lead-in comment to each function. It doesn't have to be as fancy as this. It could just be one line, but we do expect this. So it's telling us here the show intro function displays an introductory screen. Okay, so the point of show intro is just this printing statement that's going to print this program converts measurements in cups to fluid ounces. For your reference, the formula is one cup equals eight fluid ounces. Um, now, I would refer to that as an output function. I try to be disciplined about what job each of my functions is doing. Is it doing input? Is it doing processing? Is it doing output? And again, we want our functions to do just one job. So I try to be clear-headed about what kind of job, what phase of the program is this function serving. This is just doing printing. It's clearly an output type function, and it's not doing any calculations. And so notice that they made this a void function, not calculating anything. Now down here, you have this function called getCups. It says the getCups function prompts the user to enter the number of cups and then returns that value as a double. So what kind of function does that sound like to you, actually? Does that sound like input or output or processing? Now that's clearly an input function, right? Getting information from the user. That right there is a good example of an input function. So what happens here is you get a variable num cups for whatever the user types in, right? Prompt the user like you always do. Please enter the number of cups. The user sends in a number to num cups, and then this function just returns that. It's returning a double, so the return type had to be double. Now, the difference that I want you to focus on here is notice with this first function, it was void. So you don't need a return statement. That function does not return anything, so you're not going to see a return statement at the end of it. But this one down here, it does have a return type of double, so at that point you had to have the return statement at the end returning the same type of thing. Okay, so void functions don't have returns. You could, you actually could put down just return semicolon to jump out of the function, but you don't need to, it doesn't really do anything for you. But a value returning function like this one, that you've got to have returned for. So two different types of functions, whether you've got no return value versus one return value. All right, so some other details about functions here. Uh, maybe just a little bit more advanced. There's a concept called overloading functions. And overloading means basically reusing the same symbol or the same name for two different jobs. So overloaded functions are functions with the exact same name 
so how do you, how does the compiler even tell the difference is that they're going to have different parameter lists and when called the compiler determines which version of the function to jump into based on the arguments passed so if i have like you know get input with one parameter and get input with two parameters when i call get input with two parameters that's how the compiler figures out to jump into that version of the function is it syncs up the parameter list so we do this a lot actually we do this a lot in programming um, and we use this to create functions with the same name usually that generally are doing kind of the same job but on different types of data and that happens quite a bit so you see this in programming quite a lot overloaded functions kind of simple example here um, here i've got uh, four functions four different functions all called get dimensions right and so so they have the same return type of void they have the exact same name get dimensions this will totally compile but the thing that they differ in is they have different types of parameter lists. This first one just takes in one integer parameter to do its calculation. This one here takes two parameters, one int and a second int. This one also has two parameters, but again, the parameter list is different because they've got different types. This has one integer and one double. And this fourth one, again, two parameters, but it takes one double and a second double. So these are all different parameter lists. And when the compiler sees those prototypes, it will keep track of all four different functions, all four different parameter lists. Now, if I made another, like a fifth one, called get dimensions and also put one in there, that would be a compiler error because there's no way for the compiler to tell the difference if it's got the same name and the same parameter list. But as long as you've either got different types or a different number of parameters, it can keep track of the differences. So hypothetically, let's, start, let's say you defined these and you started calling them. Okay, so uh, I've got uh, integers length and width, I've got doubles base and height, and maybe there's some user input that's happening that we snipped out. So if you call get dimensions length, the compiler is gonna go, okay, just one parameter there. Obviously there's that first version, I'm gonna jump into the first version. The second one, get dimensions length width, well, it's gonna say, okay, length is an integer, I've got that recorded. I know that width is an integer, so it's an integer and an integer, I better go jump into version number two. Uh, this third one, get dimensions length comma height. Okay, so length is an integer, says the compiler. Height, that's a double. So I better have a version of get dimensions that takes an integer and then a double. Yes, here it is, it's version three. I'll go jump into that. And obviously this last one, you're passing in a double and a double and the compiler goes, okay, I better go jump into the version of get dimensions that takes a double and double. Hypothetically, if they're one that didn't match at all, right, if you made a call that just didn't match, that would be a compiler error. So if I tried to call uh, the one that doesn't exist here, like get dimensions base comma length, right? Get dimensions base comma length. The first thing's a double, the second thing's an int, and the compiler is going to go, do I have a version that takes a double and an int? No, no, not double int, not double int. And then there'd be a compiler error because there isn't any matching function that matches this uh, call. So there's got to be one there, and that's how that works. Overloaded functions. Kind of handy. We do that quite a bit. Okay, and the other thing I want you to know, uh, like kind of in advance of the next lab, is we're, we're starting to develop larger programs and we probably won't be able to get it all done at one time. So we're thinking about some ways that we can write some little parts, like maybe just one function at a time and compile it and test it and make sure at least that function is working before our program gets too long and too broken. So here's an idea of stubs and drivers. A stub is a placeholder function used in place of an actual function. And a stub function might be totally empty, is actually usually what I do. Or some people just have one single count statement that says, hey, you are in the get input function, right? Or a reminder that like, hey, I'm in a, a stub for get function. Somebody's gotta come through later on and actually do something with me. So the reason why you would want that, like maybe a function that's totally empty and does absolutely nothing, is you can use that to test compile the overall program while other functions are being developed. So let's say I've got a main function and it needs to call a bunch of other functions. Function A, function B, function C, function D. Okay, so to get started with, I start writing function A. All right, I wanna test it, but if I hit compile right now, I'll get a compiler error because in the main function it will say, function B hasn't been defined, function C hasn't been defined. 
And at that point, I'll be stuck in trying to test my component. So what I can do to, to, to solve that is just write function C and leave it empty. I write function uh, B and function D and just leave it totally empty. Now at least it will compile and I can run the program and see if my function A is doing its job properly, right? And having confirmed that, then I can go on and I can actually implement function B for real with some code in it. But at that beginning point where I just want the thing to, to compile uh, just once, um, I, I probably leave the other functions just flat out empty. Again, you want to try to focus on one little thing at a time. If you try to write a thousand line program from beginning to end, there'll be so many errors, you're going to tear your hair out and you're going to have a breakdown over it. So we try to limit ourselves to one little function, hopefully about seven lines long, so you can hold the thing, whole thing in your head, right? Just focus on the incoming variables, shouldn't be too big, and leave the rest for stubs until later. And that's a good way to start developing a larger program. Now, on the other hand, we can start talking about drivers, which is a function that is just there to call, to practice calling another function that you just developed. So the driver function uh, may call a given function possibly multiple times. We could possibly call, like if I have, you know, compute average, uh, I'll call compute average with a small number. I'll call compute average with some large numbers, something like that allow me to confirm that, you know, automatically test, really, you might say, automatically test that my compute average function is working properly for all those type, different types of things, that I can compile it, that I can pass stuff in. And what, you, what you're doing here is you're starting to automate your test script, right? Whereas we've been doing that by hand so far, you actually start setting up your program to do that automatically for you. And a driver function is basically doing a bunch of test cases for you, hopefully. Now, as we go on in our starter C++ programming sequence, we're going to start referring to our main function as the test driver because it's going to become more and more the case that the only thing the main function does is call other functions to see what they do. Uh, you're going to see that in the course here. You're going to see that in the Gattis textbook. And probably later on, like maybe second semester, the assignments will all start saying, you know, write a function to compute an average and a test driver. And that means that your main function just needs to call that, right? And it will start to become almost without saying of like, of course you need to write a test driver, but at the moment we're just focused on this one function. So those are two kind of good ways to roll out and start developing larger programs and not trying to write the whole thing at once, but just focus on one little piece, one little function and testing it and making sure that function works before you go on to the next one. All right, and that totally happens in this lab, right? In this lab here, when my students get together in person, uh, the lab is totally set up like that. There's some functions, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the larger labs, actually. It's a very large lab. I actually cut out some of this lab when we do it, it's so large. But um, it'll compile right, off, right, right when we get it to begin with, but most of the functions are just empty stubs. And then our goal is to go through one function at a time and actually make it work properly for this currency conversion program. So that, that's actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good lab to do. And if you have access to yourself, th that could actually take quite a bit of time, but it's a really good example. Now, at this point, we have seen uh, writing functions and we've seen that they're nicely isolated uh, for one programmer to not interrupt another programmer's work. And we've seen how to pass information into a function with the parameters working pass by value. We've seen how to pass information back out with the one return value. Now in the next video, we'll see something very interesting is there's an alternative way to pass information in that actually kind of breaks some of the rules that we've seen so far. But sometimes that's actually very useful. That's called passing data by reference into the parameters. It works a very different way than passing by value. So that's pretty interesting and kind of changes some ways that you might think about functions. So hopefully I'll see you next time for that.